I just moved nearly all of my portfolio into Bitcoin and was able to make enough to leave that job behind. So you actually retired on Bitcoin. I thought that if I left early enough, because I was still in my 30s, that I wasn't institutionalized, but I was. Like, I actually had to take a lot of time to just reflect on the fact that my career was done. I'm going to contribute as much as I can to my life right now in the hopes that my children's life will be better, rather than just thinking, I'm just waiting for retirement and then I'm going to do what I want. People have an emotional connection to their Bitcoin, no matter how much or how little. It's just, it's like their baby. It's like a child. Don't speak ill of my Bitcoin. It upsets me, sir. You require an ego death to be a Bitcoiner because a lot of people are going to doubt you. A lot of people are going to challenge you. You know, a lot of people are going to ignore you, but you still have to be resolute, as you say, in your ideas, your ideology of how it can empower others to be better. It is the ultimate act of altruism to die with your private keys. Bitcoin is the only thing that you can take with you to the grave, but at the same time with taking it with you, mm -hmm. you're actually contributing it out to everyone. I met people in you know Central America, they collect their income in Bitcoin, they pay their expenses in Bitcoin. There's no trusted intermediary between them and they live good lives. They live good lives, unbeknownst to most people in the traditional world. I don't want Bitcoin to go to 1 million next year because that would mean the fiat system is seriously in stress. That itself, from a theoretical standpoint, would be great. But from a practical standpoint, this means your family will suffer, your neighbors will suffer, people that you love that don't have Bitcoin will suffer. How did you retire early? And, sure. and maybe this after that, how are you got in Bitcoin? And maybe that's interesting. Sure. So my, my family, um, they're immigrants. They're Indian, but they lived in East Africa and came in uh, to Canada in the 70s uh, to you know start a better life. And I was born here. And the idea is that first first thing to do is get the best education that you can you know, secure a very good job and typically a professional designation so that you can, you know, always have employment, always have stability and not be dependent upon maybe uh, an employer at the end of the day, should you should you need to move in your career. So my, my dad was an accountant and my grandfather was an accountant. So I chose accounting, even though my inspiration was computers and computer science and programming, because when I was going through high school, that's when the internet was, uh, was, was starting to grow and become big. So my trajectory was just the predictable trajectory, like the immigrant success story that you come here and your, your children have a better life and they're able to provide for themselves. Um, and that's what I did for many years. And in 2020, um, I made partner at one of the biggest accounting firms in Canada, you know, but it was also a time in which, you know, the pandemic hit us. So I found myself at a bit of an inflection point whereby what I thought the job would be all of a sudden changed. Like technology like this, this video conferencing, although it did exist, no one really used it. You know, it's like my dad used to wear a suit and tie to go to work. And so I wore a collared shirt, a suit when I needed to and shook hands with the clients. But all of a sudden it was more of a, it was more of like an etherical thing. It was more of like a virtual thing where we interact with each other. And I just thought back to like what I was really good at before I went into accounting, which was computers. And I thought, I can't ever see us going back to normal. I was thinking before the podcast, it was in 1938, Orson Welles did like a War of the Worlds broadcast where he said aliens had invaded and people believed it. All of a sudden they just believed in this reality. And I look back in hindsight to the pandemic and people just believed they should be scared. They believed. And I don't know if that was valid or not at the time. It's easy, like I said, in hindsight, but I just knew that things would not be the same anymore because of my study of computers. So I uh, watched my stock portfolio go down, which I also also followed like logical means like accounting. You invest in index funds and dividend stocks and big tech. And you think, you know, 20, 30 years from now, I'm going to be OK. You know, but then all those stocks tanked, you know, when certain things rose, like all the new age uh, companies, the SaaS companies, um, the digital assets. And I thought mm, this would be a good opportunity if I can. I can have like a sixth sense of where the technology is going to put my money where my mouth is. So I just moved nearly all of my portfolio into Bitcoin and was able to make enough in that year to leave that job behind. But then as we talked about before, I, when I left, I kind of felt a little aimless. I took a year off, you know, think about what to do, met up with a lot of Bitcoiners. Um, and then I didn't think I would go back to accounting. And in fact, I almost resigned from my institute uh, here in Canada and um, they said, no, don't don't give that up. You never know how you can you can add value to the world. And it just so happened that uh, an ex-classmate approached me and said, do you want to start an accounting firm 
with me like a different type of accounting firm, an accounting firm that leverages technology, leverages all the things that you know. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, it's like, okay, I can still have the predictable path that I once had, but I can have more abstract thinking to apply the changes that the world faced in order to empower myself to help clients in a new and innovative way. That's super interesting. So you actually retired on Bitcoin, uh, yeah. then you made like a year uh, where you didn't uh, nothing, and then you came back to do that. What did retiring and this like or like th this freedom that you got from that uh, made with your perception of time, and, and maybe that how influenced how you think about Bitcoin and how you think about what you should do in the future with your time. There's a scene in the Shawshank Redemption when Red, uh, he finally gets out of prison and he goes to a grocery store. And every time he has to go to the bathroom, he goes and asks his boss. And the boss says to him, you know, you don't need to ask me every time you have to go, just go. But he's been, he was institutionalized because he had been in the system for so long. So I thought that if I left early enough, because I was still in my 30s, um, that I wasn't institutionalized, but I was. Like, I actually had to take a lot of time to just reflect on the fact that my career was done and it wasn't, it wasn't so easy. You know, it, it's like, because everyone else was still working, like everyone else was moving up in their career. And so a lot of that time was just, just wondering, trying to make sense of like who I was as a person, you know, because if my identity is no longer my profession, if my identity is no longer accounting, who am I really? And I wouldn't normally have asked myself that question until I was maybe 60 years old. And so when I, I, I started to ask those questions of myself, I realized I'm not ready to go all the way down this rabbit hole. It's like, I think that I can have another career. I think that I can come back and do something different. And so I more looked at it as like a one year pivot into something different. And then that's what took me down the entrepreneurial journey. So I, I paused after the year and then I returned. I love that a lot. I think that, that that's that that's what a lot of people miss. Like they, they stay in this lane, they stay in this thing they are already in and they are too afraid to pivot even a little bit uh, mm -hmm. like n not even talking about like uh, taking one or two years off completely and thinking yep. of who you are and, and thinking about where you want to go but just yep. like thinking about staying in the job and thinking of like do you really want to do that like maybe there's like some small changes you, you can do uh, yep. has I don't know what, where the connection is with Bitcoin, probably with the time aspect. Yeah. Uh, but do you see that that changing uh, the uh, when we all have Bitcoin? Like, if Bitcoin actually becomes the standard, do you think that uh, motivates or encourages more people to actually think yeah. about their time more carefully? Yeah, I certainly like. To me, wealth and success was more of a theoretical concept, but it's when you're faced with it. Like, if you could do anything, what would you really do? You assume that, you know, if you win the lottery, you're going to go buy a new car, you're going to buy a house, you know, you're going to go traveling, but those things get boring really quickly. It's like the deeper question of who you are when you have, you don't have to work for your living. You don't have to live a traditional life. I'm not the only person who's done this. Like I was a newer Bitcoiner in that regard. Like I've met so many now who face the same question that I did maybe years ago. And so they start to read the classic novels. They start to think about economics and the way the world is structured, they start to think about health. I just think that their time preference changes, whereas they think that tomorrow is the time when they're going to deal with things. They put them off, they start to deal with them today because they want to have a better tomorrow. Um, that's one thing I've really found. So the long-term thinking, like the Citadel thinking, like I'm gonna contribute as much as I can to my life right now in the hopes that my children's life will be better, rather than just thinking, I'm just waiting for retirement and then I'm gonna do what I want. They take the responsibility earlier. So I think it's definitely a challenge to do that. But I think that if the world goes in that direction, we have better long-term thinking. We move away from four-year political cycles. We move away from like fiat money. We move away from inflation and we move closer to long-term traditional values that have stood the test of time. I often wonder if this... <laughs> Uh, actually happens with Bitcoin or if we think this happens with Bitcoin because in the Bitcoin community it is right now like that mm -hmm. but in the Bitcoin community right now there are early adopters in there like yeah. different thinkers critical thinkers like we are in a very small bubble that yeah. is not only getting Bitcoin but they are also brave enough mm -hmm. uh, to actually adopt this uh, technology uh, yeah. for the future as like Uh, right now, even if you come in, but especially the people that came in like four years ago, eight yeah. years ago, or maybe yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, so, so how much of, of that Bitcoin community is like 
because we are early adopters, uh, it, it's like this fix the money, fix the world. Like how, how deep does they actually go or will there, or, or, or that, or do we think it will change a lot just because we see the Bitcoin community right now? I think the Bitcoin community is in a bit of an echo chamber. I agree. It's just like, and we think that like, because we are doing things a different way, it's like, that's the only way, but that's what the other side thought too. So it's almost like, it's such an early perspective that we share. And it's been such a short time period, really. It's the sweet 16 is Bitcoin yesterday, you know, since the white paper came out, but you can't project uh, hundreds of years into the future. If, if, if thousands of years in the past, there was no Bitcoin, you know, it's just like, are we going to end up in the same place? that those who backed the fiat system did. I just don't know, but I feel like because of the wealth aspect, because of being an early adopter, you're able to ask great questions. But I look back to like the early adopters of social media, for instance, and we look at how it was once so free and open, and then it was faced with censorship and government control. And now it's back to being open in some elements, but it was difficult to predict it because unlike to me, the fiat currencies, Bitcoin is an exponential technology. Social media and the internet are exponential technology. So whatever assumptions you make today, I think it's hazardous to assume that you will be able to understand the impact 50 or 100 years from now of something like this, because we might just be, you know, nodes in the Bitcoin network. This might just be the only awareness we're capable of after 16 years. I haven't met anyone who really understands what Bitcoin is, and maybe no one ever will. But it's like, to the best of your ability, you play the role you're meant to play now, just knowing that longer term, it may be out of your control what happens. It, it, it's, it's, it ties back to that uh, question of like, what impact Bitcoin uh, will truly have on, on this world and will truly have on, on families. I think it will have a, a major impact because there's so many things that is kind of, it's like a chain reaction, like this, this blowing fiat system, this blowing centralization of everything. Like everyone has to go to a centralized, uh, university and that's the only way someone can require a skill. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of blows up everything. And then because everyone has to go to university, they are coming out with like 30, 35, and then they have the first job. So this delays like having family, having kids. So yeah. there, there's so many aspects of that that come <laughs> yeah. kind of all in together. And it's yeah. fa fascinating for me and yeah. i really look forward to like documenting that on my podcast the next 10 years uh, yeah. and see the assumptions that we make now and, and maybe how it turns out in 10 years yeah. uh, but what do you think is the, like the biggest uh, uh unexpected impact that that bitcoin might have on, on 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 us personally i think that bitcoin forces you as i said to face hard truths about yourself and about life earlier than expected um I used to work with a lot of wealthy families who had generational wealth, who'd built it up over maybe 50, 75 years or longer. And so, you know, there was kind of a defined path that we took um, where you build a business, you know, the, the, the whoever the, the owner or the, the, the founder of the business might retire and then the children um, inherit that business and then maybe their children do it. With Bitcoin, the time frame is compressed. And so... I wonder what happens now when such great amounts of wealth have been amassed by such a small amount of people. They have so much power that even if you have the best of intentions, it's like, how can you know that the choices you make to invest that wealth, that power in different structures will be a better system than the one that you currently live in? You know, like I said, it's easy to assume that because things worked out in the past and we live in a good world now that like you'll have some contributory effect into the future. But I just don't know like the long term effect of this type of technology. Like I look recently in micro strategy, uh, Michael Saylor's company is investing 42 billion over the next three years into aggressive Bitcoin treasury expansion and being the example for the industry. But there's a whole other element of Bitcoiners who disagree with the way that he's custodying his coins. Like, is he correct? Is he incorrect? Is there another option? And there's this sort of tribalism in there where I think, I don't know if there is any one right answer. I just know that this technology hit us really fast and maybe there'll be a new technology that comes as a consequence of it. But um, you just have to do the best with the information that you have now. But Bitcoin has changed even in the four years that I've been in it. The four years, it's gone from something controversial to something more, more mainstream. It's like, what happens in four more years? I don't know, four years in Bitcoin feels like 20 years in the normal world. Also like the speed of the evolution. So 
I just don't know how to how to frame that based on my understanding of the past, like you said, a more centralized traditional approach in, in an exponential technology uh, like world that Bitcoin is in. Yeah, I think a perfect example is uh, Donald Trump's tweet, like 2019 about Bitcoin. I saw it today on, on, on Twitter. And yeah. then uh, the tweets that he does now about Bitcoin, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, like he had like a development of like, he has to adopt Bitcoin. He has to be yeah. uh, for Bitcoin now. And yeah. he's kind of the representation of like mainstream actually turning on Bitcoin and yeah. turning pro Bitcoin. That, that's fascinating for me to watch. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Bitcoin is, it seems like it's a, it should be a nonpartisan issue, but it's also tainted by different coins, you know, like the proof of work that is Bitcoin versus the proof of stake. So there is a lot of confusion. You can see why someone like him who's so busy with other things can be confused by it. But there is a clarity he seems to have found, even if he's still, you know, giving with one hand for Bitcoin and then pump, pimping his own coin on the other. At least he understands it's a relevant uh, issue to many voters. Um, so I think that's definitely a, a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, Michael Saylor, which is really interesting. Um, I just saw it a little bit. What what exactly actually did he do with this 42 billion? I, I, I don't, uh, I did not see it and I did not fully understand what he, he did with such a huge amount of money. Oh, I, I guess it was in the Q3 um, presentation that was done uh, a few days ago. And he was just explaining how their intention is to become a Bitcoin treasury company, like Bitcoin first, although they have the um, enterprise software business, um, they're just going full speed into new financial instruments, new way of obtaining either debt financing or equity financing to invest in Bitcoin, uh, to invest in infrastructure to support their movement. Years ago, when he had the playbook, like the, the Bitcoin for corporations, the idea was like, let's have other people, at least as I understood it, let's have other corporations copy what we did. But it is such an innovative thing. And there's so many so many boards that maybe are not as, like you say, we're early adopters. They're just, there's so many reasons why they can't accept it yet, you know? And so it seems like they are just going to be the leader in the space to try and experiment with different ways of increasing adoption in the corporate world. And so I don't know exactly how it will pan out, but it seems like a very optimistic um, forward looking perspective, like he even framed it compared to something like oil and like all of the different ways in which that industry grow, grew over time. So it's like not just thinking of Bitcoin as maybe a money, thinking of it as a multi layered uh, technology, almost like Andreas Antonopoulos talked about, like um, Bitcoin is the internet of money. And um, maybe MicroStrategy being a conduit for that in the corporate world. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's the best backup, uh, the best, what is it? The best recovery story ever in, 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 in the um, history of, of companies, probably because you see yeah. that massive rise they had in the dot com bubble and then they, yeah. they came down. And now yeah. they're actually coming close to the all time high of the dot com bubble again. That yeah. would be, that would be mo one massive story. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it takes an asymmetric bet like this to affect change in the world. And it's definitely a volatile company. Like MicroStrategy is far more volatile than Bitcoin itself because of the levered bets that he has made. And um, also the custody aspect is relevant, at least to a lot of people who've been Bitcoin, been in Bitcoin longer than him. Um, where are those coins held? You know, is that considered a honeypot? Will there be like a 6102, you know, one day, maybe they'll have more power than they should uh, so there'll be some sort of compromise. It's like a certain percent of his shares are owned by BlackRock and Vanguard. Um, but at the end of the day, Bitcoin is supposed to be an inclusive technology. So as I like to say, you know, we learn more when we disagree. He's doing what he can to the best of his abilities with the brain power experience and resources he has. And so too are the original Bitcoiners and the new Bitcoiners who might disagree with that perspective. Like collectively, they seem to make the network stronger and more resilient. I mean, the the whole point is like you, you should have the option of doing what you want to do with your Bitcoin. And if yeah. you want to collaborate with other big, big company, then go ahead, do that. Yeah. Uh, you might run in the risk of losing them uh, mm -hmm. because you maybe cannot trust that third party or maybe it's confiscatable with that. Yeah. But that's on you, <laughs> not, not on not on the Bitcoin community. If MicroStrategy yeah. loses their Bitcoin tomorrow, yeah. uh, depends on how they lose it. But it's uh, either a gift to the community 
community or yeah. or uh, something bad for the community but it yeah. doesn't affect bitcoin long term like bitcoin will still do its thing uh so i'm like yeah like how why do you care how michael saylor and microstrategy holds the bitcoin like it's not your bitcoin if you're a microstrategy shareholder then yeah. you might care about how they do it yeah. but if you're just like a bitcoiner like why do you even why do you even care what he says about uh how he uh custodies his bitcoin yeah you you can do it however you want to do it there are all the options out there in the world there are literally so many options to yeah. self-custody or not to self-custody your bitcoin yeah. uh i always advocate for self-custody do actually yeah. uh, go ahead and do that but if yeah. you don't want to do it like yeah. it's your risk i, I yeah. don't care of that that yeah yeah, it's interesting. The caring question. It's like, I don't know many people who really care about their stocks. They really care about their bonds, but people have an emotional connection to their Bitcoin, no matter how much or how little. It's just, it's like their baby. It's like a child. Don't speak ill of my Bitcoin. It upsets me, sir. But uh, it's just, I can't understand it other than in that framing. So it's like people take it so personally. It just, it's such a deep seated um, thing. Um, it, it has more in common with like a living thing than it does with like a, you know, an inanimate thing. It, so, so I think that I really enjoy that perspective. It's like, and, and, and it means that people who, when they dispute things, like he's forced to go and clarify if he says something in a podcast that upsets people, like, because they just are so invested in its success. They care so much about how it is perceived, what it means to them. Uh, you can't dismiss that. Whereas like with a stock, it's like, okay, the market sentiment has changed. It's like, I've never heard anyone really be as passionate about any stock with the exception of perhaps like Tesla or Apple, you know, they have a lot of, a lot of proponents who really, really root them on who have gone all in on, on those stocks. But with Bitcoin it's just like, people just really care about it a lot. And I think that's, that's uh, one of its strengths. It's Why do you think uh, it is that people care about Bitcoin so much, and what maybe is is the similarities to like Tesla? Because I was a, I was all in Tesla before I was all in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So I actually like it's it's funny that you said Tesla because I'm one that completely switched over from a, a Tesla hard corner to yeah. a Bitcoin hard corner. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm way more hardcore about Bitcoin than I ever was about Tesla, but that's another yeah. story. But how, why, why do you think that is? I think it's the ideology. There's a guy, I don't know if you know, Jason DeBolt. He's an all-in Tesla investor. I've followed him for a while on Twitter. And like, he just really believes in it. Like he just believes in it. his ideology is so strong. It's like the future will be electric cars. The future will be behind Elon Musk and the things that he believes in. I just think it goes beyond the investment. People just have a, a picture of a better world and, and they just, they can't help but put everything, every thought, every emotion behind that thing that they believe in. Like it just, it's not, it's not treated like a normal, like a job. It's like, oh, I'm an accountant. Like I'm not really that passionate about it. I don't go tell everyone what I do. You know, it's, a, it's just, it's a, it's something I do, you know, to provide for my family, but there's just something like emotional connection, almost an intuition that you know that this is really important and you feel that you need to evangelize it in such a way that others can value its importance. And sometimes in doing so, you have to sacrifice your reputation or what you once were in order to do the right thing for it. Um, I do see that in Bitcoin a lot. And that's kind of what I've become as well. It's like, I can't imagine a world now where I haven't done what I've done. It's like, there's trade-offs to investing in Bitcoin. It's volatile, you know, not everyone believes in it. It's like, it's hard to get, you know, a profession, the traditional world once you think this way, but I would never go back. I would never go back. Like I believe in the ideology of what it represents and that it's a way for us to have a better future. So the Tesla people believe that too. It's just that they're framing it a little bit different than the Bitcoiners. Absolutely. And, and the impressive thing about Bitcoin is like Tesla has a visionary leader who is on podcast. They have a big marketing budget. Yeah. Uh, they have a lot of people um, thinking about how, <laughs> how do we sell uh, Tesla? They make events around that. They make mm -hmm. a, a very well designed product with mm -hmm. a lot of love to, to actually make also that transition. Yeah. With Bitcoin, it, it's just a white paper. Yeah. <laughs> like, like there was just a white paper coming out and yeah. everything else that is here is yeah. because someone was 
caring so so deeply about it that actually yeah. he, he created something a company that uh, onboards people uh, a yeah. custody device a hardware wallet yeah. whatever it is like yeah. that's the impressive part to be honest like it's it just started with like a a, a few pages of white paper and, yeah. and some emails back and forth from Sandosh Nakamoto to other people like that that's yeah. super impressive for me yeah and it's funny uh, on the white paper day um, there was a Canadian politician, Joel Lightbound, and uh, he did, you know, a one minute, uh, I guess he just a little, a little speech in Parliament, just celebrating the accomplishment of Bitcoin, even if most people don't understand it. And he used the example of Jack Dorsey, who called it one of the biggest developments in computer science in like the last 30 years. And things that are this important may take 30 more years before we even grasp what it is. And because there isn't a founder, because it's just based on the principles you know, and that document, um, we're only slowly, you know, developing an understanding of what it is and where it's going to go. So it's, it's different than like a, a founder led company like Tesla. It, it's almost like a principles led uh, invention or technology that like, there is no one person who's there to guide it. It's like, we must guide it and lead by example. So it's fascinating to me. What do you think Bitcoin and the end of the day is like, it's, it's an, is a technology an asset? How, how would you like in, in one word, like <laughs> wrap it up what, what, what Bitcoin is? It's kind of hard for me. I don't know. It's just like, but I don't think Bitcoin is about getting wealthy. I don't know that like a lot of the Bitcoin is going to survive truthfully. It's like, because it's a bearer instrument. Um, like in my profession now, I work with a lot of Bitcoiners and we talk about, you know, the awkward things in life like death, divorce, dementia, you know, all of the things that, you know, strip you of your wealth and, and, um, over time, but there are inevitabilities, unfortunately, it's just that like how many things are still here from hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, I like to think of artwork as a very fragile thing that is still here because we appreciated its significance over time. And how messages from the past could be uh, travel, you know, into the future, into our hands. We could appreciate, um, in some sense, what people once were like. Um, if Bitcoin is no longer like in circulation, but we understand its principles, I think that we can be a better society. We can organize ourselves better. You know, like uh, Michael Saylor frames it as an engineered mon monetary system, but maybe it's an engineered uh, humanitarian system. You know, it's a way for us to function better as a society and with each other. Um, because as you say, if, if, if there's big honey pots at some of the exchanges and that Bitcoin is gone, whoever's left with Bitcoin simply has more value there. And if that Bitcoin is gone, you know, those people are left with more value. So maybe we'll get to a point in history when there's only one left, you know, and it's infinitely divisible, but we're left with the principles of what it meant so that the value of the Bitcoin was not so so much as important as the values it represented, you know? So I think that that's where it will go one day. I think that's a greater meaning to us, more so than it just being something you made a lot of money on and um, you're able to pass down to your kids and your kids' kids and, and go on. So I think it, I think of Bitcoin as uh, generational, um, just generational. Just, just, just generational. <laughs> like a generational it's just like a like a way of framing your life like to think long long term but i can't think of it simply as wealth because like i don't know how exactly like my bitcoin's going to be around for two three hundred years like i don't know that that's possible um but i do know that the things that i stood for have a chance of being around for that long so long as i can pass that message down to my children they can pass it down to theirs like that to me is easier than passing down like a bare instrument like a bitcoin like it's like, do you mean by that that your Bitcoin gets lost along the way, or Bitcoin is no longer there uh, 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 in like two, three hundred years? Either my Bitcoin gets lost along the way, or Bitcoin no longer is there along the way. But what it meant to us does not get lost. You know, it's like I don't own any really valuable paintings, but I know what they mean to me. I can go see them in a gallery, and I can look at that, and I can show my children, and they can appreciate how much effort went into it. I used to play the piano years ago, and a lot of the songs that I used to play were composed by people who did so before there was electricity, or they're done by candlelight, you know? And I look at how beautiful uh, those pieces of music were, and even the instruments they used um, were not as advanced as the ones we have today. But like, my children don't need to play the piano to appreciate um, the beauty of music. 
you know, they can know that I appreciate it and they can listen to music and, and think, wow, it's like, I can't believe how that makes me feel better or makes me feel worse, how it influences me. So too with art. Like, I think Bitcoin is more of an artistic thing like that, more of like a fundamental thing, more of a generational thing where you need to understand why, why it was created, why it needed to exist and why it evolved over time, even if you never hold any, because maybe no one will. Like the, it, there's so few Bitcoin in the world, most people won't own it. Or if they own it, they'll only own a fractional piece. But that doesn't mean that they don't have to value its importance, you know, in order for it to succeed. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. That's a really powerful thing because even if, and I think Bitcoin will be there for a long time, but even if Bitcoin actually goes away, the idea that the seed has been planted and we yep have even organized in groups uh, about the idea of sound money about uh, a better system so even mm -hmm. if bitcoin goes away tomorrow mm -hmm. we still all know that sound money is the better idea that that yeah. all those principles that we learn in bitcoin they don't go away mm -hmm. and we will just go on and try the next thing yeah. as l we will try as long as something suddenly all of a sudden works <laughs> like I, like i'm really passionate now about getting money separated from state and getting a sound money system so mm -hmm. even if bitcoin goes uh, away i will try with all i have to get a new system up and running yep. with whatever is is possible in this new world because the idea is so strong and i think that's why people care that much about the bitcoin and how yep. someone who has bitcoin talks about bitcoin yep. and why they are so passionate about it even yep. though it's just a white paper it's just an idea yep. but that idea is so strong and so powerful yep. that it actually makes a difference in the head i think that that that's uh that's the bottom line here I, I love that a lot yeah really cool yeah i like to you know ideas are bulletproof they say you know in the movie v for vendetta but i look at bitcoin it was just for me it was a ladder to a better life and with or without bitcoin going forward i'm a better person everything i do in life i i think more thoughtfully about you know and it also uh you require an ego death in a way to be a bitcoiner because a lot of people are going to doubt you a lot of people are going to challenge you you know, a lot of people are going to ignore you, but you still have to be resolute, as you say, in your ideas, your ideology of how it can empower others to be better. Um, that's a greater message than maybe you can make a lot of money or you can you can be part of a technological revolution. It just it just is such a deeper thing. 
And even with yourself, it's like, I, I like listening to your podcast because you, you ask the deeper questions, you probe a little bit more, like it can't just be about something so simplistic. It has to be more, but what's more about me and is different than what's more about you. You know, like everyone has a unique perspective about Bitcoin and how they can contribute to it because otherwise it was just an investment. You would just buy it and go back to your normal life. Like why do people feel they need to contribute to it? Like, why do they think that matters? Maybe it doesn't. It's just, you have to, it, it forces you to be humble, like to humbly appreciate it. Um, however small your contribution might be, every contribution means something. I love that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really true. Um, I also love the idea of ego death. I also love that Jeff Booth is uh, calling the, the company ego death capital. I always have to think about that. The name yeah. is so, so, so cool. Um, yeah. You also said something, uh, uh, Bitcoin is generational. A lot of people say X amount of Bitcoin is generational wealth. And mm -hmm. I think general, genera generational wealth, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier in, in the conversation once. Um, I always wondered, like, what does this even mean? Like, <laughs> what do we mean by general general generational, <laughs> generational wealth? You know what I mean? Sorry. <laughs> It's the idea that you already have enough, like it's you already have more than you could ever spend. So how do you steward that wealth correctly into the future? There are those who look at it in terms of how do I mitigate taxes? There are those who look at it, how do I secure the custody? And there are those who think a little bit bigger about how do I secure the, this ideology across time? Um, you know, it's in New York City, they have like Rockefeller Plaza you know, one of the wealthiest, most powerful families in history. And it's like you can walk through that area and just appreciate, you know, appreciate what they built, what it meant. It's just like you don't need to go to a Wikipedia page to understand like that that, that name means something uh, in North America. But how are you going to how are you gonna make sure that your name means something or the Bitcoin means something? Because because someone inherits the money, because you have a big house, you have a big portfolio, you know, because you have a lot of things. It's it's not so easy to do so. To think genera generationally, I think, is to think in an analog way. It's just like, how is it that you're a good person? So you may go to church, you know, because there are a lot of principles that are passed on historically through church. But like Bitcoin is kind of a, a religious undertone in many ways. So it's like, how are you going to make sure that like what the Bitcoin meant to you um, is valued by your heirs maybe two or three hundred years from now? And I don't think that's like a that's a traditional question that we answer. So. I've tried to frame it as like just at least facing the possibility that if tomorrow something were to happen to you, if you were to pass away um, or you were to get sick or your your mind to, were to go because um, there was some freak accident, like how would you encapsulate all of the ways in which Bitcoin changed you uh, into the next generation? And so it's like, I don't think that like just giving someone to the access to the private keys is, is the way. I don't necessarily think that like them having access to a big portfolio is the way. Um, it's more of like, how can I, how can I create some picture of what I was for them? And that's why like a painting is really good for that. Like, uh, a, a musical instrument, um, or a piece of music that someone plays is really good for that. I just try and think of it in, in terms of the generations. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Because I find that like, if you have built up wealth over 50, 75 years, let's say, um, there's been like a sequence, like over time where like, you've done it gradually. But you have to do that, like I said, in a compressed fashion now with Bitcoin, because you might have built up that same amount of wealth in only 10 years, maybe only five years if you put micro strategy. Um, you can't so easily move that knowledge to the next generation. Mm. Interesting. How did uh, Bitcoin change you, uh, as you, as you mentioned? So whereas previously I was more of a capitalist, uh, someone who would work and do tax returns, financial analysis, accounting for people. I'm finding that like the patronage and philanthropy element to be a better use of my skill set. Um, how can you give back to Bitcoin? Like for me, it's like evangelizing it in in the you know the professionalism that I possess, but also like how can you empower others to give back who have large amounts of wealth? And I believe that you know just as a contribution to the Bitcoin network were to occur, should you die with your private keys or lose your private keys, you can also give up a lot of your wealth by uh, being a patron for a cultural, you know, interest that you have. Um, Michael Saylor references, you know, it's like you could um, endow a park, uh, a museum, 
an art gallery. You could do many different things. So many Bitcoiners have invested in the infrastructure like uh, of uh, companies that uh, support private uh, su support custody, uh, self custody, or they support um, investments in underprivileged communities in the world. Um, it's more thinking about how you can give back, I guess I would say. It's like, that's the, the contribution that I make now, because it's not a question that as many people ask, but there's quite a few people who've been through a few cycles now. They just, like I said, they, they have more than they need, but um, this is a way for their their um, ideologies to move through time and be appreciated by those who come after them and and understand like um, why they did what they did. That's That's powerful. Also the idea of, should you... Like, what do you do with your Bitcoin once you're gone? Uh, give it? Do you give it to your kids? Do you give it to uh, someone close to you? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you give it to charity, to some mm -hmm. kind of organization? Or do you just like lose the keys? So you mm -hmm. give it to everyone. That's also mm -hmm. a really powerful idea. Mm -hmm. I, and I think maybe people that are a little bit earlier now to, into Bitcoin or like a, more of like in the in the beginning stages of the Bitcoin journey, uh, they don't understand now why it's so powerful to mm -hmm. uh, throw away your key and make a, a contribution there. Like why is, why is that? Like why is uh, that such a big gesture to when you die, you die with your Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sailor says it's the ultimate, is the ultimate act of altruism to die with your private keys. It may well be you're not taking them with you, you know, except that you can, you know, it's like, but you have an opportunity if you don't take them with you to give them to someone else who needs them more than you. Um, not many forms of wealth are able to do that, you know, in such a powerful way. And, and also in such a strong way, it sends such a strong message to do that. It's just like they, they believed in the ideal ideology so much, they couldn't figure out what to do with it. So they just contributed to everyone by dying with those keys. Maybe that's the best option. Like, wouldn't that be a uh, paradox of wealth? You know, that you build up so much and that the lesson is like, I didn't need it anymore. Let everyone else have it. And if we keep doing that collectively over the generations, whoever's left with it, you know, just has, has proportionally more because there are only 21 million Bitcoin. It's just, there's strange philosophical questions to ponder and not ones that we were able to do before because if you had a, some gold, some silver, some stocks, some bonds, some real estate, all of those like are, are going to change hands. Like someone else is going to pick them up. Like Bitcoin's that one thing that, that, that can't like, once you lose those keys, you cannot retrieve them. You cannot. So everyone it's, else is wealthier because of them or it, it's powerful. Yeah. Like it's the only thing Bitcoin is the only thing that you can take with you to the grave. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time with taking it with you, mm -hmm. you're actually contributing it out to everyone. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a funny, like I never saw it like that. It's an interesting perspective because yeah. you, 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 you take it with you, but you, you don't really take it with you because you, you don't use it <laughs> when you're dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even like as I uh, actually believe, <laughs> I do believe that, but may, maybe there's some, someone else, but it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty fascinating thought to, to think about that, uh, for a second, like, oh, like I, I did not think about that in, in, in that yep. way before. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah and truth it, troubled, it troubled me because it's like, that's not how I was trained to think about something. It's like the technology itself is, is profound. It's like, there's nothing else like that. So how can you frame an understanding of what to, what to do upon passing? Like I said, death, divorce, dementia, whatever the tragedy is that befalls you. It's like you can't frame it with the understanding of the own world. You have to come up with a new way of thinking about it. You have to come, way, uh, come up with a new way of trying to secure it across time. You know, it's like across space. Sure, it's like you're in a custody or it's going to be in a paper asset like an ETF. But across time, there's something that's a bearer instrument. And if you do nothing, you forget about it, it just goes away and everyone else is wealthier. It's not easy to answer. And it's too early in its journey. It's like some of the wealthiest Bitcoiners are still quite young, still quite young. The OGs, they call, they call themselves some of them. Um, so you wouldn't normally be asking yourself these questions. You might only get life insurance, you know, when you have a child. Um, but generational wealth, when you're in your, your 30s or your, your 40s and the type of wealth that you have that People would be lucky to have if they're in their 60s or 70s, if they're unbelievably successful. It's as much as it's an opportunity, it's also a burden. I mean, there's such a great responsibility that comes with being wealthy, let alone this type of wealth, you know, that that 
could ha- do so much good in the world. Like y- y- that's on your shoulders, you know? So you almost, it's not really a financial question. You know, it's more of like, like I said, a philosophical question. It's like to ponder, you know, and to ask others. Cause I've talked to a lot of Bitcoiners like with, who have that type of wealth. And I haven't found a consensus yet of like, oh, this is the one thing to recommend. It's like, it's like YMMB, you know, your mileage may vary. No one person has a solution that is absolute. Every solution is is uniquely tailored to the person. And none of them may be good solutions. We, we, like, we can't know. We won't know until later whether or not they work. Um, but there have been Bitcoiners who've passed away. There have been Bitcoiners who have moved their wealth, like mechanically at least. Um, that can be done. It's just, you know, philosophically, did you move your wealth the way that you intended to? Like we won't know that until after you're gone. So that's why I, I find it fascinating to 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 discuss. It's 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 super fascinating to, to think about the all the implications, also the freedom that uh, Bitcoin all of a sudden gives you. Uh, it, it's it's <laughs> uh, like first you you think about okay, like if if you have a business, you need a bank account, and therefore you're okay with it. There, like just the implications of like okay, you can now have a business that's available in the internet you mm-hmm. can accept in bitcoin and you can pay in bitcoin you're mm-hmm. completely outside of the fiat system at that point you mm-hmm. don't need any kyc you are somewhere in the internet obviously the person that does that is still in a political yeah. uh, jurisdiction and yeah. somewhere uh, but even there are solutions for that to be uh, maximize your freedom but yeah. but that but that thing you just like put Bitcoin out there and it's completely outside of the other system. That was a mm-hmm. huge moment that I just like had this last month where I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. like put out a, a website, a domain, yeah. uh, you offer some service, a product on there. You only yeah. accept Bitcoin so you don't yeah. need a bank account and you only pay other people in Bitcoin so you don't need yeah. a bank account. And yeah. then you are like completely free of that system. It's, it's fascinating yeah. that it's impossible now. <laughs> It is. And I do feel like the Bitcoiners, live, we live in a parallel world. We really do. Like you said, it's like you can live. And I've met people in you know Central America. They just literally, they collect their their income in Bitcoin. They pay their expenses in Bitcoin. There's no trusted intermediary between them. And they live good lives. They live good lives, unbeknownst to most people in the traditional world. Um, what if humanity forks? And there's those who live in that system and those who don't. Um, it's fascinating. Like, like, yeah, like you say, to, to, to be able to, that we even have such a system, you know, outside of the parameters control. Now it's like, there are practical considerations. You still are going to have a passport, you know, you're still going to, you're still going to pass one day. It's like, there are things you're going to have to interact with in the system. But the fact that this other one exists and the ideology is just so different. Um, I hope that we find consensus one day, you know, between the two, they merge in some way that the traditional system maybe is more accountable. And so too is the Bitcoin system, so that we can coexist. Do you think, so? So you think that the fiat system will uh, actually coexist with uh, the Bitcoin system, or you're talking about nation states uh, coexisting with with Bitcoin? I think that something as powerful as Bitcoin puts pressure on the traditional system to function better. Um, the inflation rates are too high. You know, it's like the government overreach is too much. Uh, we shouldn't have the censorship we do. But in the absence of an accountability. Uh, like a Bitcoin, a technological accountability, um, will those systems ever improve or will they just continue to get worse? Like unchecked power is not good. So that's why it's like our rules-based system without a ruler, like a Bitcoin, is a principles-based approach that I think the world was once founded on, but we seem to have lost along the way. There's a guy I follow on Twitter, Brian Romelli, and he talks about this generation being the amnesia generation, whereby, you know, we've gotten to a point now where we store our family pictures, we store our memories of the past digitally. But a lot of the analog videos and things like they're not be they're not being uploaded to the speed that they should be. So once they're gone and once we're gone, it's like the only history that will exist is on the Internet, you know, is on what you can find digitally. But Bitcoin is an immutable, transparent subledger. So like that system will always be there. And so if things are inscribed in history, even if it's just a transaction, if a transaction, it's it's arguably a more accurate depiction of history because you cannot change it. You cannot break the chain. Um, so I just think that is Bitcoin the solution? Is the other system the solution? Maybe Bitcoin just forcing the, the other system to be accountable and vice versa is a better a better consensus. I like to call it the Nakamoto consensus. 
It's like we disagree with elements of the fiat system. The fiat system disagrees with elements of the Bitcoin system. But if nothing else, human beings are resilient across history. All the wars and the fighting we've had, we're still we're still here. We haven't destroyed ourselves. I don't know if it's a game theory type of logic because there are nuclear weapons in the world, that, but no one uses them. Um, maybe Bitcoin is that type of technology, that type of that type of strength that we can utilize as a learning experience for the future to be better. Maybe that's why it was invented. Because as they say, it was it was brought on by the Great Recession back in two thousand eight. Like that's it, it almost like mandated its creation. That's uh, that's fascinating when we think about uh, there are those nuclear weapons and they are not used in the same way maybe when Bitcoin is around, the money printer is around, but they are not going to use because they know if they print 20% of the currency this year, Bitcoin will moon and <laughs> this will uh, further devalue and put get the trust out of their system so mm -hmm. kind of bitcoin puts an alarm bell uh, a mm -hmm. check on uh that that system that that's a fascinating thought of like bitcoin being the alarm bell the the mm -hmm. the the fire alarm uh of 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 the the fiat system the scoreboard of yeah. uh, of how bad the fiat system is actually <laughs> doing <laughs> yeah i love that framing of it as a fire alarm like you don't need to pull it but it is there just in case something happens. And if you pull it, the cavalry will come. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. That's also why I, I usually say that I, I, I don't want Bitcoin to go to 1 million next year because that would mean yeah. the fiat system is seriously in stress and under duress. Yeah. And that itself from a theoretical standpoint would be great. Uh, yeah. But from a practical standpoint, this means your family will suffer, your neighbors will suffer, people that yeah. you love that don't have Bitcoin will suffer. Yeah. Uh, and I don't wish that for anyone. I, I, I would like a small or, uh, yeah. organic growth over time so we can dive into <laughs> that Bitcoin yeah. revolution uh, slowly. I don't yeah. need a million dollar Bitcoin next year. I don't want yeah. that actually. <laughs> I don't think anyone does success at the expense of someone else's failure. I don't think that's that's appropriate. Um, and if Bitcoin does do that, it, it's basically just a duplicate of the system we already have. You know, it'll be like all the people with the Bitcoin, the haves and then the have nots. That's why I believe like consensus will need to be found. And I believe it will be found. Um, even to think that Bitcoin would be a political um, talking point now, um, only a short years since it was founded after, as you say, you know, Donald Trump and other politicians um, and Michael Saylor, you know, other prominent people uh, dismissed it. They can't dismiss it anymore, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Maybe it becomes more normalized and people just appreciate that it exists and they behave a little bit better. And we live in peace, at least for a little while longer, uh, rather than um, another uh, cataclysmic uh, financial disaster or geopolitical war um, in which, you know, Assets like that can really increase in value. Same thing with gold and silver, um, hard assets like a digital, a digital scarcity, like a Bitcoin. It's like, I, I just, I prefer not to see that world also. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating for me. It's, but we already, uh, um, very far again. Um, it's, it, it's really interesting you talk about that kind of side of, of Bitcoin. But there's one question that I always ask my guests, and I'm really curious also uh, of your answer. Uh, what can we learn from you besides in Bitcoin, besides uh, what, what we <laughs> discussed uh, today already? Actually, the the biggest, biggest takeaway I found from Bitcoin uh, is not about Bitcoin. It's about the subculture. Um, I used to think that the technology was about like a faster processor, you know, a faster physical processor, um, you know, uh, from a 286 to a Pentium, whatever speeds we're at now, or more memory, solid state drive. Um, but I'm finding like the, the biggest takeaway is just the power of perception on the internet and how memes and uh, other strange technological techniques can actually help educate you in a different way than like sort of like a traditional reading of the white paper, um, reading of books, like those things can influence like what you think about the world and the future. So I'm, I'm just more fascinated with like how Bitcoin has moved that way, that like online, like it's quite an egalitarian system, but those who can leverage 
um, the tools of technology and the way that they move forward, it's more of like a soft technology. So a tweet or a meme or a short video, it's like, those are things that like people have shared with me and that I've experimented with myself and I can't even believe the power that they possess because to have wealth is one thing, you know, to believe in a Bitcoin is one thing, but, but to be able to influence others to believe in it is such a great power. And Andre Karpathy is a computer scientist. And he talks about, you know, how one day maybe you won't even will regret that we gave people access to our brains through the internet. That like the things that you look at on Instagram, the things you look at on Twitter, on videos, they're influencing your mind in ways you can't predict. So it's like as much as like we rail against the censorship, we underestimate how as Bitcoiners we are influencing other people and the way that they think beyond just the money. Just because of our ability to channel technology like Bitcoin, it means you can channel other technology unbeknownst to you. Um, and, and I do enjoy mixing it up with people on social media, but I'm not so naive to think that like we just don't know what the world will be because of that you know it's 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 not just a it's not just a physical like like an actual thing bitcoin it's it's a perception of a thing and we control that perception on there so that's one thing i would i would pass on to someone else is like don't underestimate um the things that you say and the impact that they can have on others bitcoin's not the only exponential technology that we use today and take for granted mm, interesting uh, that that that's uh it's a fascinating thought. Like we we influence a lot, uh, and and we we kind of all like uh, we we kind of correct everyone in our uh, community all the time. Like we are mirroring what other people are doing, and we uh, have those mini corrections when when people interact with other people. That, and yeah. everyone sees that. Like if if you are. Uh, I don't know with with your with your wife, with your girlfriend, you alone you act differently as you would act like on a panel talking to other people uh, mm -hmm. in front of like a thousand people or as you would act with uh, your uh, best friend group or something like that. Like there's always like those, <laughs> like the, our environment influences so much uh, yeah. and you don't even realize it how much. So uh, it's really powerful. I, I, I like that a lot. Really, really cool that you brought about in, brought that up in the, in the podcast. I like that a lot. Really cool. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Like Get yeah. Okay, but yeah, Every, uh, I would like to uh, go to the end routine now. Um, or, or is there something else you, you want to add to this to this point? No, no, go ahead. Happy to. Perfect, perfect. Then uh, let's go to the end routine where the previous guest asked a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an interesting one. What was your last eureka moment? Your last moment of like, oh shit, like that. That's an interesting uh, discovery. <laughs> My Bitcoin doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like no matter how wealthy I get, um, how much success I find in my life, all that matters is what my children think of me. Like what, what kind of father I was to them, uh, whether I was there for them, whether I helped them through the difficult times that like Bitcoin has just held me accountable because it solved one problem and made me realize I have many others to deal with. So rather than like we put wealth on a pedestal, we think that when I have money, then I'm going to do this. But all of a sudden, when you have money, you realize, now what? So like, that's been the most humbling, like, I guess, perspective of my life, that uh, it's not the most important thing to me. And it never was. So it forced me to question all the other things I think are important. And children to me are, are my reflection. So I just do the best I can every day to be a humble father and a humble servant and lead by example, uh, while understanding that despite my best efforts, I still continue to make mistakes and I'll have this continued awareness with the next accomplishment that I have. Um, so keeps me honest. Yeah, we, we, we will never stop making mistakes, but we, uh, all, we, we, we should tr still try every day to do our best to, uh, get a little bit better than, than, than yesterday. I love that. Really, really cool. Yeah. Perfect. Then yeah. Thank you so much, uh, John, for, for being on, on the show. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, DM you? Oh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at John Tellis one, um, or on LinkedIn, if, if you uh, prefer my professional profile, but, um, and yeah, I just try and say something positive about Bitcoin each day, try to be, you know, creative, ironical, um, just like everyone else. It's like, I'm just a node in the network. So, uh, take what I say with a grain of salt. If I can help you with something great, if I can't help you with something, that's great too. But I just enjoy interacting with fellow Bitcoiners and, and no coiners alike. 
um, because I learn from the interactions with, uh, with people and I really enjoy the digital world. I think it's the future. So um, if you are, if not on the digital world, I don't think you exist anymore. So anyone who's out there wants to mix it up, I, uh, I, I'm happy to oblige and have a conversation. That's super interesting. Also, like if, if, if you don't exist on the uh, digital world, you don't exist yet. <laughs> it's, it's, it definitely already feels like that for me. Uh, if, if someone comes up and like, Hey, on, on a, on a conference, Hey, um, uh, we, we should do a podcast to the other. I'm like, Hey, well, where's your profit? What, what can I see about you? Like, Oh, wait, you don't have any, like, like how should I get to know you without the digital profile? It's, Good it's question. fascinating to see. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much uh, John for being on thank you so much for taking the time also thank you so much for everyone that is uh, watching and listening for joining us today as always I'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye